Um, yes, it's a pleasure to come and talk uh, to this subject. It's a very challenging one, and, and I think, as Karen pointed out, really there are no uh, easy answers to this. Um, and one of the, the key factors that I think you've heard about today very eloquently by the, the preceding speakers is, is the great heterogeneity of this disease. And so when we go to the literature to try and find evidence for the, the optimal strategy, it's, it's actually it's made very difficult to interpret because uh, within these large prospect of trials, we have patients who've got diseases that would behave in a very different way. So for example, if I, I focus on TNT, I mean, as you heard, it's a very odd um, um, choice for, for total uh, knee adjuvant therapy, uh, considering it, it, it equates to, to dynamite. Um, but the, one of the key things has been if a patient has good prognosis disease, I can't actually believe that there's a place for TNT. You know, if a patient has a localized cancer that's probably got a high chance of being cured by surgery alone, why subject that patient to triple modality therapy? It doesn't make any sense. So we really need to focus very much on that subset of patients where the prognosis is poorer. And fortunately, uh, with the arrival of MRI, uh, we've been in a much stronger position to start to select those patients. You know, for example, the T-stage vascular deposits. Uh, Gina Brown, one of my colleagues at the Marsden, has done a lot of work around this. Uh, extramural venous invasion, nodal involvement, CRM involvement, low-lying tumors. So we really need to get focused on, on those cancers that need uh, the TNT. And here are just a, a good example of a, a, an extranodal vascular deposit uh, with a threat in CRM. Now, this sort of patient is at high risk for both local failure and systemic failure. And this is another, another example here of a, of a tumor with uh, extramural venous invasion, again, predictive of local failure and systemic relapse. I mean, the standard of care for T3, T4, N plus tumors has been worked out over the course of, of, of many decades almost and eventually we arrived at the point where it was better to give chemo radiation before surgery than after surgery. It was better to give chemo radiation in general rather than radiotherapy alone. And so chemo radiation is a standard. And I think many people now, of course, use the MRI to drive the decision making about who goes straight to surgery and who needs other treatment. As an oncologist, um, does Sally Platin, for example, add anything to chemo radiation? Uh, I think that we all had great hopes that, that dialing up the chemo component of the chemo radiation would improve outcome. But we've got these four studies that actually show adding oxaliplatin to fluoropyrimidine at the time of radiotherapy is actually not a great benefit to the patient, but does increase toxicity. And as you've heard from Karen, distant, distant relapse, however, if you look at these big series, does remain a problem. So although I say that there's heterogeneity and some patients do well, there is still a lot of patients who die of systemic disease. And thus, there is a, a compelling need to try and reduce that, that risk. Actually, so when you think about chemotherapy, neoadjuvant, I always think, well, we're going to give those patients chemotherapy anyway. So why don't we give it before the operation rather than after the operation? If you look at this, is the Quasar trial, which is a UK study at about 3,000 patients in it with colorectal cancer. And there was a small group of patients in there with rectal cancer. And these people, largely speaking, did not get preoperative radiotherapy. And there was, a, there was an increase of about 6% um, or so in the survival from the use of post-operative chemotherapy with 5-FU. The other thing is that when, when you actually start to look for the evidence for post-operative chemotherapy after chemoradiation, uh, it's actually not that strong. Uh, this meta-analysis showed that if you follow up chemoradiation with chemotherapy, it doesn't make a great deal of difference. Now, I think that one of, as we've heard from, the, from colon cancer, reducing the duration of treatment doesn't seem to make that much difference. 
And I think within chemo radiation, these patients are generally getting capecitabine or 5-FU treatment, you know, right up front with the radiotherapy. And I'm sure that it does have some impact on micrometastatic disease, which is why you dilute out the effect of chemotherapy in the post-operative setting. So we do need to think about when we're considering a neoadjuvant approach, do these patients really need the post-op chemo? So again, trying to refine the, the, the groups. So actually, and if you look at the, 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 the international view on adjuvant chemotherapy, there isn't really a consensus. In North America, most people seem to get it. In Europe, uh, the ESMO guidelines you know, say that it should be considered and discussed with the patient, etc. And that's because, crucially, if you read that, that, the blue part there, it, it's because the evidence isn't that strong. And so we, we, we have a debate about systemic treatment, but without really having all the tools at our disposal that we'd like to have. So then when it comes to optimal sequencing, uh, this is a very good question. So, but you do need to be quite clear in your own mind that actually systemic chemotherapy is not that good in colorectal cancer. I mean, it's a useful treatment, but it has its limitations. And you, you want to ask the question about what are you trying to achieve with TNT? Um, well, the first thing is you might say, well, I want to obviate the need for systemic chemo. They're all gonna get it anyway. So why don't we just give it up front? Because that we will be hitting micrometastasis sooner than later. Um, will we probably get better compliance? And we know this is from every piece of research that's been conducted. If you give treatment before the operation, you tend to get higher compliance. Um, and you can improve tolerability. You might want to obviate the need for surgery. Uh, and you might want to obviate the need for chemo radiation. Just looking at, you've heard a bit about our, our uh, series of studies that, that we conducted at the Royal Marsden, and you know, we started doing this about 20 years ago with 5-FU and mitomycin C, and then we moved on to uh, oxaliplatin, and we thought that cetuximab was going to be the great uh, uh, hope for, for this disease. And, and as you saw, um, th the one thing that, that we, we demonstrated with this neoadjuvant chemo approach was, and if you look at the expert and expert C, tumor response rates are actually reasonably high in the primary tumor. So you will see tumor regression. Of that, there's no doubt. The other reassuring factor from this, these studies was that um, we very rarely saw patients progress on treatment, because I think that was always our concern. You know, chemo radiation has got quite a high hit rate if you treat uh, rectal cancer. Is chemo going to deliver the same or are we going to pe get people progressing because they've got resistance? We actually didn't see much of that, so that was reassuring. Um, you've seen these, these data. I mean, these are the survival curves. Frankly, they're uninterpretable, other than I can tell you that this is a non-randomized study. We were actually selecting quite high-risk patients on the basis of MRI. So we were doing a lot of the MRI staging before it had become a standard of care. So we did select bad patients for these studies, and they seemed to do reasonably well. I mean, we stopped doing neoadjuvant chemo when these trials ended because I became really less convinced that, that this was the way to go, just treating everybody like this. And so, I mean, we have moved on to other things. But I think if you think about to obviate the need for surgery, um, and you've heard, again, a really nice presentation about um, organ preservation. And actually, organ preservation in this disease is crucial, and, and one of the big drivers of organ preservation has been patients. The patients themselves, as you've heard, they don't want to have the rectum removed. Why would you? They don't want to end up with a permanent stoma. Uh, this is actually a, a nice study from Memorial, um, published in JAMA, and um, I mean, so it's not a randomized trial. It is, however, cohort studies. They went through hundreds of patients at Memorial who'd been treated with chemo-rad, and then surgery, or people had chemo-rad, then chemo, and then with a view to surgery. And what, what they actually found, as you can see here, was that if you give the chemotherapy after the chemo radiation and before the surgery, you do increase um, the response rates. And in particular, 
the clinical complete response rate and therefore the possibility of a watch and wait strategy is increased. Not randomised, but I think you know, tantalisingly interesting and, and reflecting, I think, what's going on in San Paolo. Um, so that's, a, that's a, an interesting uh, observation. And what about obviating the need for chemo radiation? Um, because actually, if you're going to do an operation, do you need to give chemo radiation if you're going to give chemotherapy? Um, there's not that much data out there on this specific uh, uh, topic. Again, another nice study from Memorial. This is in 30 patients. And they gave Folfox and Bevacizumab to patients who were defined by EOS, MRI, uh, CT as having relatively good prognosis disease. So they ruled out anybody that was a T4. There were mainly about a third were, were, were node negative. Um, and you know, there were some T3 uh, N1s and some T2 N2s. So they weren't putting bad patients into the study, quite rightly, because they felt they didn't want to put those patients at risk. But what you can see here is, is that they did actually achieve a complete response in, in about 25% of patients with chemotherapy. And moreover, when you look at the follow-up, they've had very few local failures. So a TNT approach, I mean, in this case, giving systemic therapy can possibly mean that you dial down in chemo radiation if you're actually going to do an operation. And this um, study here is, is a, a prospect uh, trial which is, is designed to, to really address that question within a prospective study. Can we um, eliminate or the, the use of chemo radiation in people who get upfront chemotherapy where there's a good response to treatment? And I think that's a very reasonable question. So what about further optimization of the, the sequence of, of therapy? Um, you've heard a bit about circulating tumour DNA, and um, we've been looking at this in rectal cancer uh, uh, within uh, our, our organisation. And actually, this is really very interesting stuff. So you th see the three blocks here, and this looks at the circulating tumour DNA um, as a pretreatment, uh, uh, halfway through chemo radiation, and then at the end of chemo radiation. And what this is telling you is that if your ctDNA clears uh, from the blood, and it goes very quickly in responding patients, those patients have a very good prognosis. The corollary of this, of course, is that if your ctDNA does not clear, uh, those patients have a bad prognosis. So when you're beginning to think about a strategy of where do you fit the chemotherapy, and, and can you use a molecular test like uh, ctDNA to drive the decision making? It's quite possible that, that you could you know, look at those patients who are not responding as well to chemo rad and think about adding in systemic therapy because incidentally these people get systemic disease. And this is just showing that if at any time during uh, the uh, treatment and immediately after the treatment, there's persistent CT DNA in the blood. Those patients are pre-programmed to relapse and do badly. So here's a tool that, that I think we can use um, along with MRI as, as the initial staging <coughs> as to monitor the response and possibly also assist um, our, our surgical colleagues in, in defining that, that group of patients where uh, there is a true CR. Because if there is a true CR, there won't be any circulating tumor DNA. I mean, one of the drawbacks about this approach, of course, is that not all tumours secrete DNA in the blood. And there will be a significant number, maybe 15, 20%, where you won't find it, um, especially with earlier cancers. <coughs> and we did actually show within the, this particular piece of research, um, when you look at tumour regression grade determined by MRI, uh, and that includes, you know, you heard about, you know, the... the um, the, 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 the difference in the um, intensity of the tumor uh, on MRI, and, and we showed that the TRG does actually correlate with the clearing of the ctDNA. So I think that um, ctDNA could be a, a useful tool to further in, inform us how we should use the TNT, um, because those people who've got circulating tumor <coughs> DNA after chemo rads do uh, badly. Um, and they could be offered further intensified treatment. 
So, I mean, I, I'd say that in, at the moment, I, unfortunately, I can't really make a, a definite recommendation or conclusion about wh when you should use chemotherapy. I think that, that what we do know is that, is that um, you know, neoadjuvant adjuvant chemo rad is still the current standard, but that we need to look at um, TNT to try and improve the outcome look for the people where there is systemic relapse and using this tailoring and sequencing of therapy <coughs> I think according to things like CTNA DNA may be uh, a, a, a way forward and, and certainly I think a risk adapted strategy in rectal cancer is absolutely vital I mean we can't treat all these patients in the same way uh, for the reasons you've heard thank you very much